I'm Patrick Brennan of National Review, and we're here live from CPAC with Member of European Parliament Dan Hannon, who delivered a speech this morning where he talked about the United States and, and Britain's uh, legacy, our historical legacy, our ties, our common ties and common law. Uh, he called us a, a family, in fact. And uh, so he wrote a book that basically talks about the importance of the Anglosphere and the tradition of common law recently. So, Dan, would you talk a little bit about your book and what, what, what points do you think are especially important for American and British politicians to remember? right now? Well, I mean, the, the root of our freedom is our legal system, um, which we take for granted. I mean, everybody takes things for granted. It's, it, we, we naturally become blasé about it. But this unbelievable thing that, in a way that nobody really understands, the law grew up like a coral, case by case. It yeah. came up from the people instead of coming down from the state. Everywhere else, you write a law down in the abstract, and then you apply it to a specific dispute. That's the normal way you'd expect to do it. What an extraordinary, beautiful miracle that we have this system where everything is allowed, where the law busies itself with actual disputes rather than theoretical principles, and where you have the domestication of the law. You have jury trials, locally elected magistrates, justices of the peace. You have the law as the property of the people, a mechanism for the individual seeking redress rather than as an instrument of state control. So a, a sort of a related topic to get to, 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 current, to today's politics um, is there's a, there are prospects of a U.S.-EU free trade agreement. Um, and uh, do, you, you know, do, do you think that would be a great idea? And, and what sort of what one concern with free trade agreements tends to be concerns about domestic law and domestic regulation that then have to be brought in line with then international agreements. So right. do you have concerns about it or do you yes. think the benefits of free trade are, are I mean, outweigh? I, I, I'm an absolutely uncomplicated free trade but there is a different, you know, just because something is called a free trade agreement doesn't necessarily mean that it's primarily about liberalizing commerce and extending consumer choice. There is a real danger that you get a load of bad US regulation and a load of bad European regulation and you put them together and you have more intrusive environmental standards, labor standards, social standards than you had previously. You've also got the problem that quite a lot of stuff has been taken off the table before we've started by protectionist European governments. Mm -hmm. For example, the French will not talk about the audiovisual sector. They won't talk about movies. Now, as I understand it, Hollywood is, on some measures, the second biggest overseas revenue earner for the US, depending on precisely how you do, how you do the measurement. It seems to me really obvious that the UK and the US could have sat down and negotiated a bilateral free trade agreement that would have been comprehensive and would have really been about liberalization decades ago mm -hmm. if Britain were not dragged into a common European trade policy. See, we're not allowed to sign an independent free trade deal when you join right. the European Union. You give that power up. Which, which, unfortunately, may have been one of sort of the missteps that Mrs. Thatcher made once upon a time, where she was like, well, a European common market, that sounds like a nice idea, which has then sort of led, that yeah. sort of got us to the EU in some ways. So I don't know if Well, I mean, it goes back step, before that. I mean, we lost the power to sign an independent trade deal on sure. the day we joined, on the 1st of January 1973. So it's... Uh, uh, free fashion. But, I mean, what I'd like to get to is an Anglosphere free trade area. You know, that's, that's all I'm after. We already have a very strong Anglosphere security alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, if the Snowden affair has had any silver lining, it's reminded us how extraordinarily close are the military and intelligence ties between you and us and Canada sure. and Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, we, we at National Review have argued that basically if what you look at, why, why do you, you know, why was Russia so excited to bring this guy in and why is Europe, so why is, you know, Germany and France, why are they complaining so much about it? It's basically because they're jealous that they're totally. part of the Anglosphere totally. security totally. and they shouldn't be because they don't out. invest in it. They're so. serious at being left out. But here's what I think. If, if you look at where do you take this, where do you go next? For me, the most important geopolitical question of the 21st century is whether India primarily self-identifies as an Anglosphere democracy or primarily self-identifies as an Asian superpower. Mm -hmm. If India is part of the club, then I think the whole future looks a lot warmer and brighter. And this is a really important thing to get right. And I want to pay tribute, actually, to, to George W. Bush on this. Uh, an act of statecraft for which he has had almost no recognition yes. was drawing India into the alliance of English-speaking nations. President Obama sadly has tended to neglect that relationship, but fortunately for everybody, the Indians are a patient and courteous people, and I think they'll wait for somebody better to turn up. That's very interesting. What do you think, 
um, about the situation in Ukraine now? Do you think that the EU has not been active enough, or does this just reveal the fundamental weakness of the EU? I mean, you know, you say the EU, obviously each country has its own interests and its own values. For example, the UK is self-sufficient in gas pretty much, uh, whereas a lot of the EU countries are dependent on Russian gas producing through Ukraine. Uh, in Poland, Ukraine is a real issue for voters. In Britain, it's not. We're a long way away. Uh, I'm, I'm conflicted about it. I mean, obviously I want Ukraine to move towards liberal democracy. The vision of Ukraine as a pluralist, Western-oriented country is much more wholesome and attractive than the vision of Ukraine tied to the Kremlin. But I think realistically, the price for getting such a Ukraine, or at least a Ukraine on the right road, I mean, it's not going to become a, it's not going to become a perfect multi-party democracy tomorrow, but at least for it to be heading in the right direction, may be a territorial readjustment. And that's the, that's the tough question for us to face. Are we prepared to uh, allow that to happen? And if it is going to happen, are we going to try and take some ownership of the process to ensure that any territorial readjustment is peaceful, democratic, and is the result of referendums, yeah. rather than the result of an invasion and of some sort of career style armistice lines snaking yeah. across a European country. You said you point out that, that Britain is basically self-sufficient energy-wise. The London real estate market is not exactly self-sufficient vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know Russian oligarchs though. So is there do you think there's any sort of legitimate criticism that Britain hasn't yeah. leapt to sanctioning some of the key figures? No, the I, I don't think it is because the, the the Russian oligarchs who have bought up the London real estate are anti-Putin. Uh, they are uh, you know the, 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 in fact one of the reasons why Putin has become quite anti-British is because without ever intending it, we have become in practice the home of the exiled opposition. I mean, it was never a decision we made, it just happened as, as all these guys moved to, mm -hmm. to London. Um, we've had a lot of unrelated disputes with the Kremlin. I mean, up, up top of which uh, list is the Magnitsky affair. The, uh, but we also had our own particularly British one, which was the murder of, of Litvinenko. Uh, you know, yeah. To put it as neutrally as possible, the Putin regime is being extremely unhelpful in bringing to justice people who murdered yeah. someone living under the Queen's peace. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, is, this was an early sign that we were not dealing with a mature member right. of the Committee of Nations. That was in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, yeah. that, yeah. uh, that it, it appears that some sort of former elements of Russian security killed a uh, Right, a somebody who was, was hostile to the Putin regime was murdered in what looks like a KGB-style assassination when the police tried to pursue the case uh, the Russian authorities gave uh, refused to extradite the people who were wanted for it and have been uh, as as hostile as you can be without an open declaration of pedicosity. Um, so we hear, we're hearing a lot around CPAC of, uh, about kind of this libertarian strain. There are a lot of young people around, so you kind of get that anyway, but there's a lot of excitement for Rand Paul yesterday. Um, what do you think? Do you think that's going to be a helpful thing for American politics? If it is, if it is, you know, what people, what libertarians claim it is that there's a rise of libertarian strain in conservative politics. Do you think that's a good thing for the United States? Would such a uh, thing be good for, say, the conservative party in the UK as well? Uh, certainly, libertarianism is a generational phenomenon, and that's true in the UK as well. I mean, we have quite a lot of opinion poll data about this. The younger people are, the more they have libertarian attitudes on welfare, on education, on the economy, as well as on, you know, drugs and pornography and so on. It's, it's, uh, they don't always use the word. And the, you know, li libertarianism, if you like, is breaking out of just being a sect and is becoming a, an attitude, is becoming a, a amalgam of attitudes. Um, but I don't think we're there yet, and I think we need to be realistic about something. Libertarianism is not, on its own, an electoral majority. It can be a vital part of a coalition that forms a majority. But on its own, it, there has never been a country where it's been more than 50%. So what I would say to libertarian friends watching this, what I always say to libertarian friends in the UK, look for the common ground with the broader conservative movement, right? On most things we agree, on free schools, on shifting people off welfare, on tax cuts, on national sovereignty, you know, on cutting bureaucracy, we agree. Don't become obsessed about the porn and the drugs, right? For most voters, those are not the key issues, yeah. and it's a fight you don't need to have. Yeah. There's, uh, there's another uh, one idea that American, some American politicians have been looking at and, and, and thinking about that, that the Conservative Party in Britain has been pursuing is 
consolidating welfare programs into, I forget what it's called, something like universal credit, yeah. so that, that a certain number of programs can be consolidated consolidated into just sort of a cash grant. Um, do you think that's been, has that been a successful program? Do you support well, we're, we're, we've only just started. Yeah, but do you think it's a good idea? It's hard to know. I mean, I wouldn't ever underestimate the ability of the standing bureaucracy to cock up even the best policy in the implementation. So, you know, once all the consultants and computers get involved, who knows how it's going to end up. But the idea definitely is a sound yeah. one. It means that you get around this problem of welfare paying better than work, which has been a problem. I mean, you know, we, we, uh, we've assimilated nearly 4 million people in the last 20 years from overseas. Most of these were unskilled workers walking straight into jobs. And yet, we had, at the same time, nearly 4 million people economically inactive in the UK. How could that possibly be? The answer was, it was they were behaving rationally. They were pursuing the incentives. How many of us, I mean, how many people watching now, if we're being honest, would get up at 4 in the morning to clean toilets if they were only going to be better off by 20 cents an hour? Right. If that was the deal. So, we, in, a, in a way, you can't blame people for sure. responding yeah, to, to, bad, to bad incentives. The good news is, it's started to change since this government took over. If you, if any, any American who travelled to the UK five years ago, most of the people you'd have come in contact with as, a, as an American visitor would have been Polish, right? right I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the receptionists, the, the hotel staff, the waiters, the porters, yeah. all yeah, of those people would have been Lithuanian, yeah. Polish, whatever. Now, a large number of them are British. And the reason for that is we've tweaked the incentives. It's, it's less easy to remain on of benefits. But at the same time, we, the, we gave an important carriage. You don't pay any tax on the first £10,000 you earn. And the combination of those two changes has incentivized people to take minimum wage jobs that they previously wouldn't have done. Well, it's an idea that perhaps has some, uh, some real currency in America as well. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, Member of European Parliament, Dan Hannan. Thank you.